Asian Middle East, East and North Africa, Africa. and I'm Yara Asma, the Regional, Regional Strategy, Strategy Manager of the Palestina. And I would like, I would to, like to welcome all our friends, our friends supporters, and followers. And followers. Putting, Putting me on, on the map is what is we what intended we to do this year, but of course differently. We wanted to address with you, through our different programs and projects, the emerging issues and trends uh, in our hyperdynamic region. And then Corona happened, and we suddenly found ourselves all locked down in our rooms, unable to meet or interact. As much as this period can be difficult for all of us, we sought through MENA on the map to digitize the, the approach. Live from Founders Bay in Beirut, again, I welcome you all and welcome my co-host and my friend, Philip Abouzaid, and of course, the first guest of the first episode, the Secretary General of Liberia International, Gordon McKay. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Yara. In my turn, I would like also to welcome our viewers and uh, our esteemed guest today, Mr. Gordon McKay, the Secretary General and CEO of Liberal International, the World Federation of Liberal par Political Parties, a network and a platform of over 70 political parties that has 1,000 members of parliament. Um, Mr. Gordon is also a former member of parliament of the Republic of South Africa and shadow minister of energy. You can say that he is a perfect guest today to discuss with him the latest on the fate of democracy, freedom, and political situation in the globe and post-COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Gordon, good morning. Good morning, Yara. Good morning, Philip, and good morning, uh, viewers. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, how are you spending your lockdown period? <laughs> um, I'm being very strict. I'm staying in my flat in London. Um, I don't go out for anything. I try to go shopping every three days and I avoid everyone. So I'm, I'm definitely sticking to the draconian rules of the government and keeping very far from everyone and everyone else. This is, this is great to know. Of many of our viewers as well do as you are doing, uh, Yara. Like, um, Gordon, like as, we, uh, as Philip mentioned that the theme of this episode is the post-corona period and the uh, fate of democracy. This episode, especially this episode, comes um, under a, an important initiative that FNF MENA is uh, launching, which is Crisis for All, Chances for Everyone. This initiative that aims at encouraging like-minded people to respond to the crisis, of course not on the medical level, but through our value-based work. And uh, to remind the people that freedom is still the struggle, regardless of what the world is witnessing, and our role is to protect it, regardless of all the circumstances. I started with my first question that I would have never imagined asking back in 2019. Are liberal democracies under, are, uh, under real and rapid threats nowadays? Um. No, I think it's not to say that democracy is under threat. I think we need to acknowledge that prior to COVID, um, huge populations globally were questioning the value of democracy, um, and that has only been exacerbated by COVID. Um, the Open Democracy Foundation pointed out two days ago that 2 billion people on the planet now live in a country where parliament is either fully suspended or has been fully or, or largely restricted which means that there is no real parliamentary oversight over governments during this very critical time. Now, to a degree, that's normal. In a crisis situation, parliaments generally do, do have to take adaptive measures um, to allow government greater sway to act and respond. However, with the huge amounts of money that are being committed, the huge amounts of money that are being spread around the world in response to this crisis, there's very strict draconian rules that are being implemented to, to, to curtail people's freedoms. We have to worry that uh, parliaments are not functioning and not working. Now, this is not only in countries in Africa or across democratic countries as well. Australia, for example, has suspended their parliament until August. Uh, many Western parliaments have been suspended until at least the middle of May. Um, and this is hugely troubling because at the heart of democracy is a, function, is a functioning parliamentary system. Um, and also, we must never forget, as we more and more power, it will be far more difficult for us to take those powers government um, at a later stage. Many governments have started to, uh, to use very draconian laws around tracking, using cell phone towers, using cell phone information to track people's movements around, for example, um, the spread of COVID. P 
possibly a necessary step, but one that will, that will send shivers down anyone's spine who in any way supports the belief of freedom of movement, freedom of expression, and, and uh, human rights in general. So, yes, we had a question before COVID where people were questioning the value of democracy. COVID is de definitely exacerbating that. And at the moment, millions and millions and millions of citizens around the world seem very okay handing over their freedoms to government in the current crisis. The big question is, Will we be able to reclaim our freedoms post-COVID when the world goes back to normal? Mr. Gordon, um, how do you evaluate the role uh, and the response of liberal parties um, and other parties vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19 crisis? Um, <laughs> People will that uh, working with liberals is kind of like herding cats. Um, liberals, by definition, um, support uh, personal uh, innovation, individual innovation. Therefore, liberals often have divergent responses to the same question or crisis, which is not a bad thing. It just means that the liberal response has, in many cases, been quite different and divergent. Um, so, for example, you will have in the Netherlands that they have not moved down to a full lockdown. Um, they've tried to balance the economic measures along with health measures. Britain, I ever have, which are liberal democracies, have taken far more draconian steps um, to enforce a response to COVID. However, this was quite late in the day. I see governments here recognize that people here take their individual freedom quite seriously, their economic freedom quite seriously. So the governments have been somewhat more restrictive. However, for example, in very draconian, they've introduced laws and restrictions that are far more severe than, for example, than those were adopted during World War II. Um, where <laughs> at the onslaught of the Nazis against Western Europe. So the liberal response has been variable. Um, it has been divergent. Um, there is no consensus point at this time on, on, on critical matters. I think there's a basic assumption that in liberal democracy, citizens can trust their governments um, to behave within their interests and to return to their state of normality. Um, and I think uh, where liberal governments are actually in power, I think that's probably a realistic expectation. However, we mustn't forget that all governments, no matter where they are, that lack of tea and lack, a lack of an enforceable mechanism by citizens to hold their governments to account will always overstep the line. It's just a name. Um, so we should be a bit worried. Um, liberals need to start co lazing and working harder to make sure that there are timelines and restrictions on how long government can call for parliaments, how long they can suspend basics. Um, so we as liberals have at the moment been uh rather late in our hours. but i think what you will have noticed since sort of the end of march beginning of april there's a lot more work being done by liberal organizations liberal political parties liberal civil society groups to start holding government account and to start saying whoa stop um, you're implementing these rules but when will they be retracted um freedom of movement is important freedom of expression is important how do we make sure that these things return to normal when there's some sort of state of normal returns the problem with COVID, though is that we don't know when that is going to be um, so it's a difficult situation in which we have to trust our governments and we have to curtail animal rights at the moment, but for how long and until when, and how do we supervise that? How do we hold governments accountable? How do we keep having them come back and ask the people for permission to extend these rules? Um, because to extend them indefinitely would be really harmful. Uh, after the, the crisis, what will happen? I would like to reflect a bit on our region and on MENA. Like, MENA is already an unstable region where already democracies, uh, if they exist, are threatened by different factors, ideological, political, religious, ethical, economic, and social. Um, and those threats also are, are uh, reflected differently and shaped in, uh, depending on the country. Like. Uh, 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 we have conflicts in Syria and Yemen, uh, in Lebanon we're suffering from uh, corruption as well as in Iraq. Uh, the Arab Spring came like as a moment for, for like liberal movements to like um, rise and uh, it was a moment uh, uh, out of history that, that just like jumped in into the world and tried to, to democ democratize the, the uh, certain states and certain countries in the Arab world. Do you think that the COVID-19 is also an opportunity for liberals to rise again, especially that with the, with the absence of effective governments, if I want to say, and not generalize in the Arab world, individuals have important roles 
in, in, um, um, in like uh, coping with the situation and in shaping the uh, uh, um, uh, general framework of governance in Arab in the Arab world. So, what do you think of that? Yeah, I, I picked up only about half of that because my sound has gone a bit. That's why I put in some earphones just to make sure that I can hear you better. Um, but I understood from the crux of your question that we're focusing on the Middle East and implications for um, democratization in the Middle East and the yes, implications yes. for COVID, um, yes. etc. Yes. Um, is that kind of correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. Um, it, it's Jara. That's a very, it's a very difficult question. Um, and I'm always sensitive coming from an African context uh, that uh, examples aren't really traceable in difficult environments. Um, and that d democracy means different things in different parts of the world. And that at the end of the day, a democracy lives or survives or functions on the population's interpretation of what democracy and freedom means to them. And obviously within the Middle East and in the MENA region, um, democracy and freedom feel um, you know, w w can be defined in many different ways. That's not to say that 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 the, the freedoms of value are, or the, the values of freedom are uh, uh, interchangeable or they're relative. It just means that how how individual populations interpret freedom and democracy are relevant to a specific time and place and population. Um, I think the difficulty within the MENA region is um, as post-colonial environments, such as Af many African countries, and such as the one I come from, um, democracy. Um, can at times have, have a very strong negative perception attached to it, especially when it's attached to the perception of liberal values. In many countries around the world, the idea of liberal values are seen as sort of <laughs> sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, they see as they're seen as an attack on family values, an attack on religious values. They're seen as an attack on um, on, on on piety and and the very sort of societal structures that exist within these societies um, prior to sort of westernization or industrialization. So within post-colonial environments, I think the whole idea of democracy is a contested one. The whole idea of freedom is a contested one. And also the whole idea of what are what are shared values within society are contested. Now, COVID <laughs> just exacerbates all of that. Um, because I think one of the critical elements that we need to be aware of is, and this is coming back to the idea that I keep linking here, is what is the citizenry's perception or of democracy and freedom? Now, let's not forget about in 2017, um, a major NGO um, did an assessment in the United States on different forms of government. And 20% of Americans under the age of 35 said that they would be willing to experiment with a totalitarian system of government. Now, this is in a, in a country that supposedly or has been democratic, has had democratic government for over 200 years. Um, and yet 20% of people under 35 are going, yeah, we'd probably prefer a military general as a president in some kind of authoritarian state um, within this environment, which constantly tells us that democratic values are shifting and changing um, and that democracy has to be seen to be valuable to the individuals who want it or live in a society that is democratic. Now, I think in the Middle East, I think um, my experience of having been in the region on, on a number of occasions, that there's a deep thirst for um, democracy and accountable government, um, but there's also a natural tendency of conflict between um, Western-style democracies that are underpinned by liberal values and how that might respond to societies that are particularly religious or more traditional and have different cultural values. So I don't necessarily have the answer for what that looks like in the MENA region. I just believe that anyone who works in, in democracy promotion and, and the promotion of liberal values needs to, one, understand what, how the citizenry perceive those as valuable to them and work with their own notion of what those things mean. Because as I said, freedom means different things to different people. Um, democracy means different things to different people. Uh, but at the heart of those ideas is a basic respect of individual individuality, basic respect for accountable, non-corrupt government that can be held accountable by the citizenry. Um, in post-colonial societies, and when I was a member of parliament, I used to talk about this a lot. We, as Africans in my case, um, we, had, we, we spoke a lot about what does African democracy look like? What does African idea of freedom look like that are relative to our value systems and our, our structure within our society? And how do we take those forward to make sure that we hold our governments to account and that we give individuals the maximum amount of opportunity to thrive as individuals within our society and take advantage of those opportunities? So those are the underpinning features of what I think are necessary. Um, and as I said, COVID threatens both of those. 
COVID by definition means less freedom, less democracy, less accountability, because in these, in an emergency situation, governments have to act quickly. They don't always have time to ask for uh, feedback or opinions. So um, I think potentially COVID could be a restrictive factor on that. However, it's also an opportunity, like all crises, I think uh, COVID provides us with a real opportunity to rethink, take a breath, to rethink why is our democracy important to us? Why are democratic elements of accountability important to us? Why, as an individual, do I have these individual freedoms? What do they mean to me now that they've been removed, potentially? So there's a real opportunity for citizens to re-engage with the idea of democracy and individual freedom um, within their society. So that is the, uh, the flip side, I think, the opportunity that we have during this crisis to work through that. Now, that's not to say that this opinion is probably will be criticized by some hardcore liberals or hardcore Democrats, yeah. but I fundamentally believe that for democracy to take root in societies where it previously existed, it has to be relevant and it has to be acknowledged and it has to be shaped by the local populations um, if it's ever going to succeed. Mr. Gordon. Uh, starting from your answer, um, one of the main challenges uh, may be, for example, if we have a country where we should have elections, for example, um, and they do not have the electric vote or they cannot vote from distance. Do you believe um, in this context, for example, COVID-19 can jeopardize the democratic process? And what do you have as suggestion? What can be done to maybe protect uh, uh, the right of the people so that there will not be an over abuse of power during these times? Well, that is a very difficult question. Um, as you know, there are about, uh, um, I need to, um, this figure is probably not correct, but I know that we were looking at about 25 countries this year that were supposed to hold elections. Um, you will have noted uh, about two weeks ago, the current Polish government was wanting to move ahead with elections by some kind of postal vote that hadn't been approved by the electoral committee. Um, and you will have also noticed that Guinea um, moved forward with, with elections despite the COVID situation. Um, and that the fact that the United States will have the presidential election come November. So lots of countries will be holding elections this year. Um, and we need to ask ourselves, uh, do elections need to be suspended in these cases? Um, uh, my personal opinion is that you should always adhere as closely as possible as you can to your constitution and to your values, even in a time of crisis. Um, I don't think it's impossible to hold an election um, under COVID. I think it just means that there's a lot more work. Um, I'm not sure what your experience has been in the Middle East, but for example, we've had a very practical experience of supermarkets here. Yeah, creating social distancing between um, individuals um, <laughs> within supermarkets, creating the two-meter gap. Um, and so, yes, there are very long queues outside of supermarkets across Great Britain and London, for, for example. Mm. However, people need to go to the supermarket. They're still going to the supermarket, and it's somehow seemingly working that there are ma not mass transmission of COVID while people are shopping at the supermarket. So I know it's a trite example. I know it's a small example. But fundamentally, in my, my Opinion, election held um, if necessary or very important um, and should be held where possible. Um, that said, uh, you know, really and elections, they need to put a time frame on the suspension um, and that they, that suspension needs to be approved by parliament, uh, by a functioning parliament, and that if they wish to suspend it again, they have to re go back and reseek um, uh, sort of permission from parliament to postpone. I think there has to be a very clear link between elections and the postponement of elections and the people and the will of the people is best expressed through the parliament. Um, and again, not all parliaments are equally strong around the world, but it's still important to show that the, that the executive is held accountable um, by the legislative, uh, legislative body. The legislative body um, you know, has to be consulted in terms of those, uh, in terms of those postponements. So I think realistically, you will see postponements um, in the elections. It'll be very interesting to see what happens in the United States if the COVID crisis continues to expand um, and how that'll affect the November elections. Um, I think, for example, this is a country that will continue to hold elections despite COVID. Um, but I think the only way that we can truly make sure that there's a link between the decision of government and the people is to continuously make sure that the decision is approved and ratified by Parliament, and that that decision is reviewed on an ongoing basis as long as the crisis continues. Uh, and what do you think of, like, with our, um, which actors are 
the, the important actors to mobilize again after this crisis, especially that we're witnessing a lot of like uh, breaches against human rights in terms of like if we want to talk about like numbers in, in, in Jordan and in Lebanon, uh, the number of like uh, uh, um, uh, domestic violence or like the cases of do uh, domestic violence are increasing. If we want to talk about freedom of expression, especially in countries like like Egypt, like lately two uh, two uh, reporters from the Guardians were kicked out of the countries, uh, the country because they questioned the Egyptian authorities' uh, count of cases and and and. Uh, um, in, in Egypt, like which actor should be supported after this uh, after this crisis, and uh, because like on the government level, um, like initiatives can be intrigued if liberal parties are 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 uh, active in, in these countries, but in countries like in, in Egypt, like uh, who would protect this freedom of expression again? Who would uh, like bring again the the question of freedom? when uh, when um, the whole rhetoric is concentrated on security and the importance of the security um, against freedom. It's incredibly difficult um, to answer because as we know, Egypt is a very specific and difficult case. Um, I think if we answer your question at a sort of a macro level, um, macro. I, <laughs> I come from and I have my background in civil society and NGOs. Um, and within an African context that I come from, civil society and NGOs are critical uh, societal participants, um, often uh, more so than parliaments or parliamentarians in holding in holding governments to account. Um, you would have seen um, at the international level the fantastic work being done by organizations like Human Rights Watch, Open Democracy, Amnesty International. Um, mm -hmm. These organizations have, uh, have always played a important role across the world and globally. And I think even more so now that they're refocusing their work, their work um, on responding to COVID um, and preventing or monitoring human rights abuses in this environment is critically important. I think one of the big questions that has, you know, that we haven't seen a lot of airtime and media time around specifically in sort of Western media, the impact of COVID um, and protectional governance structures on countries like uh, that have significant burdens of refugees. So the Syria question, you know, hangs uh, looms large in our thinking around that. Um, how much, for example, will be condoned in the Syria condition, or um, con considering uh, <laughs> the COVID crisis, what will be swept under the carpet, what will be ignored? Um, within the Egypt situation, I think uh, the rhetoric uh, was pretty much about security before. Um, this just strengthens that narrative. It strengthens government's hand. Um, it's incredibly difficult because the Egyptian situation, the government has been very successful in reaching out in the opposition or even civil sort of civil society responses. Um, Egypt, I think, uh, will will really maximise the opportunity uh, provided by COVID to really lock down a society and uh, any dissidents towards the current regime or system. Um, I don't think there's a quick answer to Egypt. Um, it's strategically and ge geopolitically important um, within the region, which means that Sisi will continue to support the support of various guys around the world as long as he sort of promotes stability within the region. Um, and there are broader questions um, on how we respond to that. It's even more difficult now because as citizens, we can't take to the streets, we can't protest, we can't make our voices heard. Um, which again, I suppose, means that we have to lead a digital campaign, very much like the ones that were led um, through the Arab Spring. Um, on the one side, you know, governments are much more prepared to deal with that. There have been a number of internet shutdowns uh, globally uh, since the COVID crisis started, particularly in a, um, in a country like Egypt. I'm sure <laughs> an internet shutdown is not far, far behind. Um, I think, you know, if we have to think about how do we respond to that, we've got to look at creating international pressure. Um, we've, got to, we've got to keep Egypt in the spotlight. Uh, we as organizations like Liberal International, FNF, liberal organizations, human rights organizations, um, we've got to constantly keep uh, keep the light on and the pressure on Egypt um, because it's only through that continued pressure and support um, for individuals within the country resisting the um, and we will see progress over time. But I think you're absolutely right. I think the COVID situation complicates the Egyptian situation and really and that isn't helpful for those of us who wish to promote democracy. Um, and in the, the, the thing, thing that, that uh, Egypt one is one of countries that uh, where we actually um, is an example of like different countries who are suffering from the same 
uh, situation, but also like uh, the struggle of the civil society organization now, as we know, like and even international organization is sustainability amid this crisis. And like um, this is the question that as is being asked like uh, post COVID-19 uh, period, like uh, what kind of world order will we have? Because big economies are already suffering uh, from uh, from the situation. What about like the, the, the international organization who actually get their funding from from these, um, um, uh, uh, who get their funding from governments, from f uh, and doing fundraising and and so on. The different like like ways to actually get funding are now being um, uh, threatened because of the situation and because of the urgency of the situation. Um, uh, yes, Gordon, yes, you want to say something. something? No, no, I'm I was just trying to catch all of your question, Yara. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, a very important uh, question. Um, how will the international global order have changed post-COVID? Um, and I think that that's a very important question uh, that we don't necessarily know the answer to, but we do see signs of a change in the political order. You will have noticed the way that both China and Russia um, have responded to the crisis, how um, splinters have been created in Europe by China providing support to Italy, Russia providing support within Eastern Europe, uh, well ahead of, for example, agreements with the European Union to assist, uh, assist its own members. Um, this raises question marks within the minds of the citizenry around the importance of such things as the European Union and such things as the importance of, of democratic governments. Um, China has gone uh, on a massive, massive public relations campaign, uh, which is essentially a combination of sort of fake news and sort of promoted social solidarity. They're showing solidarity with the world, while at the same time completely hiding or misconstruing or forcing facts around the, around the COVID around the COVID crisis in China. Um, so I think it's very clear that the, the you know, while the United States has sort of retracted into its own, uh, into its embargo. So I think that we saw geopolitical currents of a shifting world um, prior to COVID. I think COVID will have accelerated that in some regard. Um, I suppose, how does that affect international civil society? Um, well, it closes the space of international civil society. Um, as you will know, China and Russia have very strict regulations against uh, civil society and international NGOs. It makes it very difficult for them to work in all sorts of parts of the world. Um, China increasingly exerts its pressure outside of its borders um, in to prevent uh, civil society groups from, from working and functioning, specifically when they're critical of China or Russia's uh, approaches. To the world, so I think I think Yara, a change your political order um, at the international level will be one where we see um, the assertion of individual nation states. We'll see more China power. We'll see more um, adherence to sort of China ideology, um, and this will fundamentally shrink the space for international civil society um, and make it far more difficult for, for groups like ours to function and work. Um, that doesn't mean it can't be successful. It means that the, the rules of engagement are changing, the environment in which we work is changing, um, and that means that our ability to affect um, or respond to crisis in such as Egypt, Syria um, will be more, more challenging and more difficult. Um, and we need to stop bracing ourselves for the changed environment, I think, is, is the, sort, of the, sort of the summary um, to that question. It's obvious that, that uh, the, the economy is, is, um, is in danger uh, situation. Yani if you, uh, how do you evaluate the impact of COVID-19, for example, on, on world economy? You just answered part of that question, but especially on industrial countries. I mean, uh, like Europe, China, USA, like big industries um, who maybe um, they, they will affect their, uh, their export and uh, maybe other and smaller economies will suffer the repercussion of this. Some countries are facing uh, hunger fears, uh, or um, how do you see that? Uh, well, it, it looks particularly dire on the economic front. Um, this morning, um, a statistic was released. They expect the British economy to have contracted by 35%. Um, you will have recognized that 50% countries that are responsible for 50% of the world's production. Um, 
I think the industrial countries will definitely suffer. However, uh, the industrial countries have far more uh, rigorous um, and supportive social welfare systems, which cushion to some extent their populations. I'm incredibly concerned for countries like South Africa um, and other developing countries where the long-term impact um, or prognosis is incredibly negative um, because you will see there will be, because of sort of industrial economies being in decline or, or having, having shrunk over this period, we'll see a decline in developing countries' exports and therefore what they can import. Um, this will have a real impact on, on everyday people's lives. Um, specifically in many countries like South Africa, Turkey, Morocco, uh, many countries of the Middle East, many of our people live on, um, on the informal economic sector um, and we can expect massive damage to be have done to the, informal, to the informal sector. The real problem with this crisis is that it's, 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 it creates both um, a crisis of demand and a crisis of supply. Um, which will definitely really, really result in some kind of long-term recession, if not um, some kind of depression. Um, at the moment, I think within the business communities and, and people that are the business leaders that I'm speaking to, there's this very strong hope that we can bounce back very quickly, that we can return to full production um, within sort of quarter three, quarter four, when the crisis is under control. Um, however, the longer-term impacts for developing countries are going to be far more difficult. Um, there's going to have to be a concerted effort to support these countries with some kind of financial assistance and aid um, via the World Bank or other uh, other lending mechanisms. We probably need the establishment of some kind of equivalent, the Marshall Fund um, that was established for Europe after World War II for sort of reconstruction elements. This will probably become very necessary for developing countries who will definitely need to have to have access to liquidity um, to ensure that their country can continue to, to function. Um, I think for countries like Lebanon, which already had an acute uh, financial crisis, um, this might be a particular challenge. Um, the critical thing is, is here is how governments will respond to populations that become restless or um, find it difficult to make ends meet. Um, fundamentally, the picture, I think, on the economic is quite dark, it's quite gloomy, um, and I'm not seeing very much, uh, in terms of the literature and in terms of people's responses, there isn't a clear idea of what the quantum of this mess is yet. No one quite knows what the exact cost of this is going to be. Um, and the prognosis are really dark. That said, however, um, you know, after the last financial crisis, we saw the emergence of multiple, multiple tech startup companies that were driven um, as a result of the failure of the financial crisis to, to kind of promote new forms of entrepreneurship. Of, of new forms of innovation. And we saw, for example, within the virtual period after the financial crisis, companies like Uber were established, Airbnb, companies that are now massive uh, global entities um, that have created thousands of jobs and opportunities. So while I think the overall financial crisis that will come out of will be severe, um, we as a must also look to the fact that there will be a lot of opportunities. So lots of companies that were teetering or not healthy would have been cleaned out by this crisis. Other, so other companies will become stronger. There'll be potential for new innovation, potential for new suppliers. Um, <laughs> new, new suppliers might emerge. I think we mustn't forget that in critical and difficult times, uh, it does promote human innovation. And I would like to concentrate on the fact that I believe that the MENA region in particular, and many, many countries in Africa are particularly good at innovation. And we might see, um, with the correct kind of support, which is always a big question mark, we might actually see this, this crisis result in a longer term benefit, uh, potentially for, for thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. So the crisis is bad. It's going to get worse. Um, but let's hope that it results in the kind of innovation we saw after the last financial crisis. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to like uh, the point that you mentioned on like um, how the world uh, coped with uh, the financial crisis in 2008, and you mentioned like all of these like big uh, companies uh, growing like Uber and and like uh, um, uh, startups uh, emerging, just like Facebook, like uh, um, uh, Twitter at some point. Uh, uh, but these these big uh, uh, companies. Uh, who were startups started at startups uh, put like a question of like uh, the threat of big data as well so now like uh, big data like even before COVID-19 was a big question like who owns the data and how is data is being maneuvered and like these big data companies became uh, important players in the in the global economy um, now with the all the collaborative research that is being done on finding vaccines for COVID-19 on on um, uh, finding cures for COVID-19 and the existence of these big data and the economic collapse, 
Don't you think that we are uh, under, like, we're facing also a bigger threat of having like a new type of big brother that like uh, might shape uh, the world in a different way, that might shape our demo democracies in a different way? Um, Yara, I think again you you raised incredibly the questions that were emerging around um, social media companies. Um, and sort of the digital economy and the use of big data and algorithms and AI. Um, that was starting to emerge quite strongly in sort of the international uh, discussions over the last year and a half to two years. Um, and that is a question that we will see intensify um, going forward because we're only at the very beginning of that sort of economic journey. Um, the use of big data and the use of AI is only in its infancy. It's only going to get a lot worse, a lot bigger, a lot more. Um, and you need to not forget that this is a geopolitical question um, that will bring us into direct conflict uh, with two different models, um, economic models. We have the China model where big data is completely unregulated in China yeah. and yeah. is leading uh, the world in terms of AI development and system where all this data is continuously free everyone can use the data the data is being generated and these algorithms to go through the data and it fundamentally is giving China an economic and political edge into the digital economy that comes up against the sort of european and america this american approach but they say sort of the european approach where big data has to be protected under privacy rules um which is good because we need to have protection of our individual rights and freedom around privacy and our human rights but at the time it also restricts the ability um, for AI to use big data and develop. And it's very important for AI to develop that it has huge, huge, huge amounts of, of big data to process work. So it becomes a very much a, a sort of a political economic question about the Chinese model versus sort of the Western model and whether w which of those models will, will win. Um, so it's difficult because China will, will take a leapfrog step ahead on the economic front. Um, while Europe is trying to defend people's individual rights. So they, they're, it's a very clear example of where they are possible. Um, and trade-offs around um, big data and AI and how it is used and what it is used for. I, however, stand firmly in the corner that our big data must be protected and that as all individual data needs to be protected and that the fact of the matter is how it is used and what it can be used for should be regulated by government um, through legislation and regulation. Uh, that is not a clear-cut question because I said there's an economic imperative to how that's used. More importantly, I think also um, what we will see under COVID is that we may have um, big, this data is now being used as surveillance data um, by government to assess the COVID threat and to kind of make sure that people are keeping social distancing rules. And I'm far more worried about the fact that governments have not given themselves the power to use this personal data for surveillance. Because how do we claw that back from governments? Like, so the South African government introduced a law about a month ago. I mean, in six months' time, I mean, hopefully this COVID crisis is over. How are we going to get government to give that up? The amount of the amount of insight that that provides on individuals and political sort of individuals in society to government is massive. Governments are not going to want to give that up. I mean, in the UK, for example, uh, you know, it's, it's the most surveilled country in the world. There are more cameras per person in this country than anywhere else. Um, and again, uh, you know, how that data is being used, facial recognition, AI, all of this stuff. Is still in its infancy, it's being debated. Um, and there are no good practice models yet, and liberals haven't been at the forefront of that conversation. With liberals know that we need to protect privacy, we also need to recognize the economic and security questions which flow from these issues, which are not as clear cut as before. And there will have to be some kind of um, around what are the what are the trade offs and what are we as a society willing to trade for security versus privacy, uh, privacy versus. Um, and that's a question we haven't really come to grips with yet. And I think other parties aren't facing that yet. Um, and for example, I'm very worried about countries, for, for example, many countries like mine in Africa, where um, countries can sort of leapfrog into this new digital domain and start using people's data, using AI, start using facial recognition in ways that society aren't even aware of yet, that their legislative bodies aren't even thinking about, that there aren't any regulatory mechanisms to even have justice and government really started implementing using this technology in a very negative way potentially to regulate and manage their society. So Yara, I think it's an incredibly challenging question. I think it's uh, particularly in countries where there's um, authoritarian government or lack of oversight or effective democracy. Um, those are the countries that are going to be most heavily impacted post-COVID by sorts of uses of new technology in a way that can infringe people's rights. Um, and that's pretty scary. 
uh, Gordon, uh, Gordon, like, like all the topics that we covered, that we uh, covered throughout the interviews can be like dissected into like thousands of panel discussion that we can discuss in uh, in depth and especially that COVID-19 came to change this world in an unprecedented way, an unexpected way. Uh, before we end this uh, this very nice uh, debate and discussion with you, we have to basically two uh, quick questions for you. Uh, uh, I start with like the question of Philip, who's very much interested in South <laughs> Africa, and I know that he loves South Africa. Yeah, I've been there. I love it. I, I I'd love actually to be quarantined there. It's it's a <laughs> it's an amazing place. <laughs> Uh, Gordon, I, I just have a, a question. We have seen, unfortunately, some uh, some events uh, on the streets, some uh, violence uh, in South Africa due to the uh, unemployment, due to to the situation uh, that got uh, more complicated because of COVID-19. What is your comment on that, and uh, what message do you have to the current uh, government? Well, I think uh, this is exactly what we're talking about. Um, government has been really overzealous in implementing um, security measures against the population um, on the basis of COVID. Um, this has been su supposedly quite necessary because within South Africa, we have a high level of our population that live in informal housing. They live in very difficult conditions. They live a very in close proximity of each other. And this is seen as a very um, fertile ground for the spread of COVID-19. Um, that said, however, the police and army have taken the fact that the military has been deployed on the streets of South Africa is always worrying. The military should only ever be used uh, in the last instance. Um, our police forces have been um, have had numerous cases reported where they have physically beaten um, individuals for for uh, moving around mission. Um, and this all stems from the fact that, as I said, most South Africans uh, co exist on sort of the informal economy and they need to move around to sell goods, to get money, to get food, to the very basic, uh, to survive, essentially. Um, so, you know, South Africa has implemented first world restrictions, um, but has not recognized the fact that it does not have a first world economy. And therefore, many of our people um, will face a very difficult uh, times and we can expect greater social unrest um, if, if we don't lift the curbs uh, um, very soon. I absolutely deplore and reject the fact that South Africans are being beaten up by their government. I think that the current government should be ashamed and that we will definitely make sure that we will take meetings to the Human Rights uh, Council within South Africa and where we will take government on directly for its abuse of individual human rights. And I think every country in the world where that is possible, we should do that. We should never fear to hold people, our governments accountable. They are accountable to us as the people. And I know, for example, my political party in South Africa will be filing um, sort of uh, papers with the Human Rights Commission to ensure that we hold government accountable and that those people who were beaten will be compensated by the state uh, for their very bad and egregious behavior.